Hello, everyone. My name is Meredith Langlitz, and I am the AI's Director of Programs. Welcome to the February 2023 edition of Archaeology Abridged. For those of us joining for the first time, the Archaeological Institute of America is North America's oldest and the world's largest archaeological organization, with over 200,000 supporting and subscribing members. From its founding in 1879, the AIA has been committed to supporting archaeology and archaeologists, publishing and disseminating the results of archaeological research, and providing programming, like this one, for a variety of audiences. If you aren't familiar with the AIA, we are a membership organization. Our programs are supported by our members, so thank you to all of our members today. Um, if you out there, um, if you're not a member, please join us. Uh, you can read all about the benefits of membership on our website at archaeological.org slash join. And by becoming a member, you can stay apprised of all of our upcoming programs. Speaking of upcoming programs, I'd like to give a quick pitch for what we have going on next month. Archaeocon 2023 is happening on March 11th, and we'll showcase live talks about Stonehenge, Egyptomania, and the Moai of Easter Island. Included with your ticket is access to these presentations, as well as a hands-on workshop uh, and on-demand content, including exclusive interviews and fun archaeology games. Tickets are just $10 through the end of this month, so be sure to go buy your tickets today. Uh, next month, we'll also be talking with Dr. David Carballo of Boston University about Aztec Mexico at the time of Spanish invasion and colonization on March 14th and 15th for AI Archaeology Hour and on March 23rd for Archaeology Abridged, so be sure to register if you haven't already. I want to emphasize that beyond the support we receive from our members, the breadth of programming that the AIA provides is only possible because of our donors. We could not do public programs like this or back archaeologists to support future discoveries without our dedicated donors. If you can, we encourage you to join this group of contributors with a gift, large or small. Again, you can donate right now on our website at archaeological.org slash donate. All right, please note this is a live presentation. The AIA will be recording this presentation, but we ask that you do not. If you would like to see the recording from today's talk, we will post it on the AIA's YouTube channel within the next few days, and we'll send everyone that is registered a link when it's ready. All right, if you joined us last week or this past Tuesday for Joan's talk about her work on Euronisos and nearby Maniki Harbor in Cape Drapanum, Today's format will differ quite a bit. Archaeology Abridged, as the name hints at, is a shorter talk, so Joan will give a 20-minute long presentation that will be followed by ample time for questions. We love to see your questions, and since there are a lot of you on here and the chat tends to get lively as well, we ask that you use Zoom's dedicated Q&A box to submit your questions for Joan so that they don't get lost. I'm so excited to introduce you all today to Dr. Joan Connolly. She's a classical archaeologist with excavation experience throughout Greece, Kuwait, and Cyprus. Since 1990, she has directed the NYU Euronisos Island Expedition, leading an interdisciplinary investigation of the island's ecology, geomorphology, archaeology, history, and maritime connectivity. Connolly was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship for her work in Greek art, myth, and religion. You may be familiar with her books, uh, The Parthenon Enigma and A Portrait of a Priestess, Woman and Ritual in Ancient Greece, as both were named to the notable books of the year by the New York Times. The Parthenon Enigma also won the Phi Beta Kappa Society's Ralph Waldo Emerson Award in 2015, while Portrait of a Priestess won the James R. Wiseman Book Award from a venerable little institution you may be familiar with called the Archaeological Institute of America. Uh, we are in for such a treat today because Connolly has not only been decorated for her scholarly work, but also for the passion and skill with which she shares it with others. She has been the recipient of the AIA's Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award, NYU's Golden Dozen, Dozen Teaching Award, and she holds the NYU's Lillian Vernon Chair for Teaching Excellence. She has also lectured on AI a tours in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, if you are at all interested in small group tours led by experts to archaeological destinations, you should definitely check out the list of tours offered by AIA tours on our website. 
But before I start daydreaming about vacations, let's kick this off as we've asked Joan to present Why Our Island Secret in just 20 minutes so that we have plenty of time for Q&A. So without further ado, take it away, Joan. Thank you, Meredith. I cannot start sharing my screen until something happens, it says. Okay. The other participant is sharing. Should let you share now. Okay, here we go. Voila. Thank you so much, uh, Meredith. This has been a real pleasure to come together to ask the question, why are islands sacred? Those of you who tuned in earlier from my Archaeology Hour talks will know the that, that this question is prompted by our 33 years spent exploring and excavating this captivating island off the western shores of Cyprus on behalf of New York University. We thank the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus and the series of directors under whom we have worked for giving us the privilege and pleasure of a lifetime in exploring this unique place on earth. Its very place name, Iero Holy Nisos Island, tells us unambiguously what it meant to those who traveled out to it in antiquity. Writing in the late first century BC, and the first century CE, Strabo and Pliny both reference an island or place called Iero, holy, near to Paphos. The distinctive islet that rises before you is no doubt the site of which they speak. To this day, Uranusos remains a beacon, a destination, a magnet, a place that inspires a longing to experience what is out there. It dominates the visual landscape, or coastscape, as it were, a marvel that enables us to share in a vision that is unchanged from that seen by men and women for the past 5,800 years. This is when the land bridge violently collapsed, severing the narrow peninsula from the mainland. Voila, the island was formed. As the golden beams of the rising sun hit Uranusos at 6 a.m., it is easy to understand how this place came to be associated with the divine. Sacred islands are a global phenomena, and there is scarcely a culture on earth that has not designated some local island as a place endowed with heightened spiritual meaning, remote holiness, contemplative isolation, separation from the profane, and ultimately a destination for pilgrims. Today, I invite you to think of your favorite island, whether it is a recognized sacred island or an island that is sacred to you in particular. Think of the ways in which geology, ecology, and landscape generate myths and stories about your special place and how these translate into traditions, ritual practice, repeated returns, and the establishment of networks. If you are of an age where you have not yet experienced an island, then know that something extraordinary awaits you. Having an island that is your special place in life is life enhancing, and it will set you on a journey like Odysseus with some Ithaca ever on your mind. The range of meanings ascribed to sacred islands is broad, varied, and culturally determined. I cannot speak to the global phenomena, but I can offer some few humble insights into islands I have known within the ancient Greek orbit. We start appropriately with the Ur sacred island, which is foundational to our understanding of how islands become holy places in Greece. This is, of course, Delos, sitting dead center in the Aegean Sea with the great dance of the Cycladic arch archipelago encircling it. We hear from Callimachus, writing in Alexandria during the third century BC, that Delos was windswept, stern, and wave-beaten, inhabited only by seagulls and fishermen. Intriguingly, Delos was unfixed. The island floated freely upon the open sea, blown by the wind and carried across the Aegean to ever-changing locations. Known as Adelos, 
the unseen or invisible. Its original name, Callimachus tells us, was in fact Asteria or star. The island was named for the lovely cousin of Zeus who leapt from heaven into the deep sea to escape his unwanted amorous advances. There she became the island Asteria. Rebuffed but not deterred, Zeus turned his attentions to Asteria's sister, Leto, who succumbed and straightaway conceived the famous twins, Artemis and Apollo. Zeus's wife, Hera, was enraged and forbade Leto from giving birth on terra firma. Indeed, no fixed land would welcome Leto as she wandered from place to place searching for a spot in which to give birth. It was unfixed Adelos, that is Asteria, her own sister, transformed into the floating island that finally provided safe haven. I show you a vase in Palermo with Leto at far left, beside the palm tree where she gave birth to Artemis and Apollo, who appear in the middle of the image. At far right, we see a figure that has been interpreted as the personification of Delos, that is Asteria. Miraculously, once Leto was delivered of her babies, the island put down roots and stuck fast in the center of the Aegean. Thereafter, it was known as Delos, the visible, no longer floating or obscure, no longer hidden in the mists of the ever-changing seas. As we look upon Delos, let us for a moment consider the phenomenon of appearing and disappearing islands, of their mutability as they transform in ever-changing weather patterns, shifting seas, emerging mists, and varying light. One can understand how this captivated the ancient imagination, evoking an aura of the divine. It is no wonder that, surrounded by water and ever-changeable, Womb-like islands came to be associated with divine birth and transformation. Callimachus recounts the very moment of childbirth, how Leto leaned in hard, gripping the trunk of a palm tree as she endured a long and difficult labor, giving birth first to Artemis and nine days later to her twin Apollo. Leto cries out to her son, why child do you weigh your mother down so? Be born, be born my child and gently issue from my womb. Here on this spectacular red figured pyxis found in Eretria on Evia, we see Leto grasping the Delian palm tree with her left hand and bracing herself with her right as she grips the birthing stool on which she sits. The nine-day-old Artemis precociously serves as her mother's midwife, assisting from behind as the long-awaited Apollo is moments from birth. It is interesting to note here that Apollo, that Leto herself was born on an island, the island of Kos. Her mother is the Titanus Phoebe, from whom Apollo receives his epithet Phoebus. Projecting forward into historical times, we find that the Ptolemaic Egyptian queen, Berenike of Alexandria, also gave birth on Kos to her son Ptolemy II Philadelphus in 308 BC. It seems that the act of giving birth on an island renders both mother and child divine. And here we might ask, what is it about the watery embrace that manifests the magical powers of the insular? How do islands invoke birthing imagery, a floating in the womb, mobility, mutability, the transformative and life-giving powers of crossing from one realm into another? Furthermore, does the act of crossing the water affect some kind of purification and rebirth, a ritual cleansing, allowing one to leave the profane world and enter the realm of the divine in a pure state? Perhaps this line of inquiry can get us a step further in answering our question, why are islands sacred? Some years ago, when sailing from Naxos to Santorini at dawn, I was mesmerized by the ever-shifting appearance and disappearance of landfalls along the way. I began to imagine the ancient experience of sailing in a world without media, without moving pictures or film. And it struck me that this enthralling movement, changeability, dynamism, and aesthetic kinesis was the closest thing to watching a movie in the ancient world. 
the thrill, perils, and fear, the longing for landfall exper experienced on the voyage, and suddenly the miracle of safe arrival, boom, clarity, visibility, fresh water, snug harbor, safety, all brought into high relief for me, the ancient experience of insularity and the sacred. It is not surprising that on the model of Delos, small islands all across the Aegean became sites for the worship of Apollo. Just to the southwest of his famous birthplace beyond Paros and Antiparos, we find the amazing island sanctuary of the Spatico, excavated since 1997 under the direction of Dr. Janos Korraios. Over 20 buildings have been revealed so far, attesting to the worship of Apollo and Artemis from the late 9th to early 8th centuries BC through the monumentalization of the sanctuary during the archaic period and on through the Hellenistic and Roman times. Large clay statues, figurines, seals, vases in the shape of animals, Corinthian Arab alloy, jewelry, faience from Egypt, beads from Syria, ivory and ostrich egg from Africa, all point to a thriving votive practice and connections with a wider world. Pot sherds inscribed with the name Apollo and numbers of archaic marble koroi point directly to the worship of Leto's famous son. Here you see a reconstruction of the holy precinct with its two-roomed temple, semicircular altar out front, and by its side the three-roomed Hestiatorion for ritual dining, complete with rooms lined with benches. Intriguingly, to the northwest on the island of Tsiminitira, Tiri, the, which was connected to the Despotico before a rise in sea level at the end of the archaic period, a circular platform has been unearthed, measuring some 26 meters in diameter. It has been tentatively identified as a dancing floor by Dr. Erica Angliker, who in a forthcoming publication will discuss the centrality of performative dance in the worship of Apollo. When we leap to the Eastern Mediterranean and the small island of Uranusos, which I have presented during AIA Archaeology Hour earlier this week, we find a similar pattern of temple style building, dining and sleeping rooms, and a circular platform, possibly for dancing, all within an island sanctuary of Apollo. The temple style building on the Western Cliffs has produced a Sippus altar stone offering trays and quantities of pseudo Egyptian mold made lamps all pointing to a ritual function. Once adorned with ornate architectural moldings, plastered and painted to resemble marble, the small Ionic temple measured 8.48 meters in width that of 16 Egyptian L's or royal cubits. The size of the building is roughly comparable to that of the Temple of Apollo at Kurion on Cyprus and the Temple of Aphrodite at Fabrica Hill in Neapophos. Indeed, the Temple of Apollo at Kurion, some 75 kilometers to the east of Uranusos, dates to the Roman period, but sits upon earlier Hellenistic foundations that determined its size. We shall now consider how, as at Kurion and the Spotico, Uranusos was equipped with dining and sleeping rooms. These stretch across the southern cliffs of Uranusos and show a series of five by five meter square rooms, the floors of which were found teeming with drinking bowls and cups, spouted strainer juglets, fish plates, and casseroles. We can recognize in some of the assemblages what seem to be individual pilgrims kits deposited in the corners of the rooms. Here you see an amphora, an Eastern Sigillata A cup, and a frying pan in situ and after conservation. In another corner, we have a grouping of bowls, beaker, trefoil, mouth doinakue, casseroles, a stone anvil or cutting board or lamp holder. We have sheep goat and pig bones, and limpets, cowries, and top shells, and the repeating formula on your Uranusos of pierced disc, amulet, and needle. Some vessels have holes drilled through them for the insertion of string for fastening to a belt. 
Other vessels like this Kalathos in West Slope Ware from Crete seem to have played a ritual function. But the strongest pointer to a pointer to the ritual function of Uranosaurus is found in these 20 limestone amulets that look like nothing on earth except those amulets that are shown draped on statues of temple boys or young boys going through the transition at the time of weaning deposited in Cypriot sanctuaries of Apollo. You see below some of the uh, motifs on the amulets show traditional Cypriot types like the free field bird, but beside you see the double crown of the Egyptian pharaoh, mixed hybridity, Ptolemaic Egyptian um, iconographies together with traditional local Cypriot. This is an amulet that shows two male names, Minas on the side and the Afantes on the bottom. And the pendants are interesting as well. This carnelian frog pendant that probably signals fertility is an Egyptian import. And this scarab showing the goddess Sekhmet, the lion-headed goddess who looks after motherhood, medicine, and warfare is of special significance. Cleopatra herself is associated with motherhood and warfare, um, and particularly after the birth of her child by Julius Caesar, Caesarion, she takes on the Isis crown as part of her iconography, another motif that we find in the Uranosaurus amulets. Which brings us to the circular structure of Uranosaurus, two concentric circles of uh, retaining walls filled with marine silt dredged from the seafloor and brought up the cliffs, poured into these rings, one 13 meters in diameter, the outer ring 21 meters in diameter. Remarkably, the 13 meter diameter corresponds exactly to the diameter of the dance floor at Corion that you see on the right. I now show you that the Spotico dance floor compared to the Uranosaurus, the Spoticos is slightly larger. Now to be sure, it is impossible to prove something is a dance floor when no one is actually physically dancing upon it. But these circular structures that we find within sanctuaries of Apollo are worth investigating to be sure. We are thinking that the divine Egyptian triad of Horus, Osiris, and Isis is, finds its incarnation in the late Ptolemaic period in the triad of Caesarian, Julius Caesar, and Cleopatra, under whom the sanctuary on Uranusos flourished. And here we may have the traditional Cypriot tradition practice of placing boys under the care of Apollo coming together with Ptolemaic cult interest to produce a kind of Apollo Horus Caesarian sanctuary that may be seen as a mimesi or a sort of birth shrine um, in celebration of this child who after all is the great, 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 great grandson of Venus, Aphrodite herself, born just up the road in Paphos. We were very fortunate in the early days of um, our work on Uranusos, really blessed to have the great, the legendary architect G.H.R. Mick Wright work with us, surveying and setting up our grid. Of course, Mick had had a very storied career in Egypt during the building of the Aswan High Dam. Between 1961 and 1963, he was the genius behind the pulling down, relocating, and reconstructing of the Kalabsha Temple, some 50 kilometers upstream from the dam. In the following years, he worked on the Abu Simbel relocation and in moving the Philae temples too. It was from Mick that I first learned of the island sanctuaries of the Upper Nile. Um, island sanctuaries that flourished under the Ptolemies and where we have army garrisons and pilgrimage worship uh, coexisting. 
And I had it always in mind to get to these island sanctuaries, but only managed to do it exactly a year ago. Right now, I spent February in Nubia uh, exploring these islands, and I am now convinced that the Ptolemaic administration, Neopophos, would have um, seen Uranusos not as a problem for construction, waterless, uninviting, challenging uh, Uranusos that nobody had tried to uh, build upon since 3800 BC when the land bridge collapsed because there was no water, nobody tried. But in Neopophos, they of course knew very well the island sanctuaries of the Nile. And the Egyptian uh, army engineers were very expert in building on Nilotic islands. Uranusos would have been business as usual for them. And so I would just like to look uh, perhaps at a, a different kind of Ur sacred island, Bige, and its relationship to Philae. Now, Biga Island, uh, and as you know, Philae, again, uh, is submerged thanks to the building of the dam, and all of the temples were moved on to Agilka Island um, some time ago, and Mick was involved with that as well. But let us reflect for a moment on uh, Biga, sacred to Osiris, and the neighboring island Philae, the original Philae, sacred to his consort Isis from at least the 7th century BC. These two islands have a special relationship in that Biga is believed to be the source of the Nile itself, which was thought to flow forth from a cavern deep below it. And it was also thought to be the setting for the tomb of Osiris, or at least the burial place of his left leg after his brother Seth cut him up. Uh, the Philae Temple's main temple is sacred to Isis, his consort, and the statue of Isis would be put on her divine bark and it would sail across to Biga Island to visit the resting place of her husband in a, in a uh, ritual spectacle that would have been quite enthralling. So this relationship between the two islands is important. And on Philae itself, we have the main uh, temple to Isis. We also have Osiris worshiped here and Horus too, the divine child, and a mimesi, a birth shrine to this child. And I show you here an image of the birth shrine um, that has the uh, head of Hathor uh, thanking it along. And so there's a communication between these two islands and the cults upon them and the gods upon them who move and uh, relate to each other even after their deaths. So I believe that, um, and we can we know that it was Ptolemaic army engineers using the Egyptian L as a unit of measure who built very rapidly on top of Uranusos. But I think that perhaps their comfort and inspiration for developing this island is to be found in the upper Nile. If we could just hop across to the Arabian Gulf for one moment, I would like to show you the island of Phylaka, just off the coast of Kuwait. Uh, this island was named Icarus by Alexander the Great himself after hearing about it from his exploratory team that went down to find this full of water island oasis. Here, uh, the successors of Alexander's armies built a fortress that was functioning from 300 to 100 BC with a dry moat around it and dead center in the island, uh, in the fortress, a temple to Artemis Tauropolis, straight from Greece. Of course, the name uh, Icaria is borrowed from the island Icarus in the Aegean. The temple there is quite remarkable and hybridity is the name here. Just as we have seen on Uranusos, the hybridity of Ptolemaic Egyptian and local Cypriot. Here we see Greek architectural forms combined with ancient Near Eastern forms, with uh, Iranian forms, with forms here of Persepolis column bases, 
uh, topped with ionic column capitals. So this remarkable a temple showing again, the mixing of traditions, though in fact, the mixing of populations because these descendants of Alexander's armies, this is an army garrison primarily, um, were intermarrying with local women. And we had the fun of working with the material found in their little houses that come straight up against this temple. It was a magnificent time, 1985, a magnificent team. And I had the best of mentors, Dr. Teresa Howard Carter. And we were working with the in these houses and on these floors, we would, we would be finding um, Papa Selenus, uh, Greek style, um, almost Tanagra type figurine on the left. And then you see, a typical ancient Near Eastern Astarte type figure on the right. And that's Indus Valley Blackware, finding it on the same floors with Greek pottery. So a true mixing of East and West. And just um, on the holy front, this is not, a, no island is only holy. We have a garrison, a big garrison here primarily, but this is the place of worship. On Uranusos, I think we have a small garrison and a, a big place of local worship. Um, but here you see, again, hybridity. We have inscriptions to Zeus, Poseidon, and Artemis in the good Greek tradition. We see Heracles presented in very Greek style, but next to him in limestone here, we see a kind of Heracles Melkart, more, more a more Near Eastern type of Heracles with an earring. Uh, we see a Tanagra type figurine and an Astarte type figurine. So again, the Greek world interacting with that of local ancient Near Eastern um, traditions. This is very fun and exciting to see, for me, the two islands that I know best, uh, Phylaka and uh, Yaronisos, one Ptolemaic, one Seleucid, um, where this phenomenon, uh, every time these two entities interact, it's local, it's it's different. It's it's. But this is how these islands can function. I have to say that in closing, I'm so proud of the, our 33 years on top of this island, but we kept it. We kept it holy as we moved along. We always had annual clergy day. Here you see the Archbishop of Cyprus. Then he was the Bishop of Paphos helping the abbot of Ios Naovitos Monastery. Now he's the Bishop um, on to the island for a day of digging. And we would like in closing to salute his holy beatitude, Archbishop Chrysostomos II of Neo Justiniana and all Cyprus, rest in peace. Uh, we lost him on in November of last year, so this will be our first season in uh, since 1989, since we do not have the pleasure and honor of, of visiting with him on or nearby Yaranisos. Thank you very much. Wow. <clears throat> All right. Wow. Thank you, Joan. <clears throat> As someone who has spent a lot of time on the Balearic Island of Menorca in the Western Mediterranean, and uh, who was lucky enough to have visited Molokai in Hawaii, uh, there's definitely something about small islands that really captures my heart and imagination. So it, it's just so cool to think about think about islands in antiquity. Um, but let's get right into questions. Um, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please use the separate Q&A box that Zoom provides. So it does not get lost in the chat. Uh -huh. And then maybe we can, yeah, that, all right. Uh, okay, so Joan, I am so glad that you brought up the dance floor because you mentioned it in both of your previous lectures very, very briefly. And I was so surprised no one asked you about it. Um, but I do already have two questions about it um, from our audience members today. Um, so one of our audience members, Michael Burmeister, asks, uh, to test whether the circular structures are in fact dance floors, is there any way you can test for differences in compaction, like due to dancing within the circle versus outside the structure? Is there anything like that uh, that well, could be done? You know, it's impossible to prove it's a dance floor. It is a platform. Now, I um, 
I don't know if Erica Anglicker is in the audience. She may well be. And I want to thank her for the photographs of the Despotico, uh, along with uh, Dr. Janos Karaios for uh, sending me those images and allowing me to use them today. I don't know what the um, in the the earth inside of the ring is like on the Spatico, but ours is very special and it is very labor intensive and it seems really strange. Uh, it's hard to imagine. Well, let me tell you what it is. It took as many years to to understand this. The, the earth inside those circles is imported. It's not Uranusos earth, um, which is basically red decomposed mud brick from the buildings that collapsed during Uranusos. This is white, yellow, yellow white. It is fine grained. It is like sand. It's like marine silt. It is marine silt. And it can only have been dredged from the sea floor and brought up with great effort probably in, you know, on donkeys and wet, sloshy mud, uh, silt. Um, the thing is that it digs like cement. It hardens to a, a compactness that you can't believe. Uh, and w after many, many years, maybe a decade of digging it, um, it was noted by Dr. Paul Croft, the greatest excavator ever, who has been working with us for 25 years, that um, many of the sherds that he was removing were marina braided that looked like sea glass. And so we got out all the pottery ever found in this special earth. And to be sure, the quantity that with marine abrasions on it, so it looks like sea glass, only it's pottery glass. Uh, and it, then I said, let's get out all the marine shells we've ever found. And we pulled those out. And yes, it had a, a huge concentration of more marine shells than any of our red earth ever had. And Paul has estimated that there were something like 430 tons of this earth had to be brought up to the top of Uranusos. And we now understand poured wet into these ring walls because some of it seeps under the wall uh, walls. and why would you go to all that trouble? Why would you do that? If it, and I know that people say when archaeologists don't understand something, they say it's ritual. Uh, that's <laughs> a, such a cliche, but it is a very labor intensive thing to do. And um, I have, uh, well, we, we have, it played around, and it's thanks to a, a site visit with uh, Christopher, Christopher Faraone of um, University of Chicago, um, that this, uh, it may be ritual uh, engineering, uh, that is dancing on the beach, dancing on the sand is part of the foundation myth at Delphi of, of the shipload of of, uh, of the god and the young uh, soldier, the young sailors dancing on the beach that, that became his first priests. And dancing on the beach as we have also at Miletus on the beach um, in the sanctuary of Apollo Delphinios, there's an altar on the beach. So maybe there is uh, a necessity or for cult reasons, I know I, <laughs> for dancing on sand. Um, I don't know, it's an unprovable. But what would be interesting, I would like to know what is, is the earth different inside the, the Spontico circle? Now, um, I also dug, I'm so lucky, I dug at the Kurion Sanctuary in uh, way back in 1981 or two. And um, and so I know that, that dance floor well, but if you get a repeating of dance floor, these circles in Apollo sanctuaries. And of course, uh, song dance was absolutely central to the cult worship of Apollo, the god of music and dance and boys. Uh, then I think we can, we can strengthen our argument by looking sideways at other sites that have something similar. Okay. Um, so we do have another audience member had another, another angle to ask about. Gladys Montgomery asks, 
given the similarities and the dimensions of of the of the temples and the presumed dancing floors do you imagine that there were architects or engineers that traveled from island to island to oversee their design and construction or it was a you know unique builders well not an, i don't think so i i mean because uranusos for example none of the other sites are using the egyptian unit of measure um and that is a giveaway uh and also uh, I think that it's the garrison at Neopaphos. It was the capital of, of Cyprus under the Ptolemies. It was a great center for shipbuilding. It was the center where, you know, the, the Ptolemies deforested Western Cyprus to build ships because they, to make the Ptolemaic fleet. Um, it was a center of trade and it, uh, there was a big presence there. Um, they use their own unit of measure. The, our cistern is nothing like anything in the Greek world. It is of a type known in the Western desert of Egypt and also in Tunisia. It is a North African trying to get it, every drop of water in the impluvium to feed it down into the holding tank. So this one, uh, I think the Ptolemy, the Ptolemaic armies went around, you know, they're famous for being able, this lovely book by Christelle fisher Beauvais um, on the speed with which they could build cities and sanctuaries on the Red Sea. They were very efficient. So they traveled around wherever they went to, they had to set up camp and go to it. Lickety split, they thought nothing of it. Only they could develop Uranus. And after they, after the collapse of the Ptolemies, nobody tried to build anything on that scale again on Uranus. Um, okay, so I guess building on that, we have uh, someone, uh, Professor Sylvan Kaffel is in the audience. And uh, oh, you, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure uh, I can too. And, and writes, uh, could you kindly expand on your intriguing notion of islands as of locales of religious hybridity? Uh, and I know you mentioned, you know, that this dance floor is unique, you know, this they use the Egyptian, you know, measurements in a, a and and you see this like over and over again in other islands as well as sort of the hy the hybridity. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't I'm only speaking to islands that I have personal experience with. I wish I had even more lifetimes to experience more islands. I think I have a, I have a running list of Greek islands I have visited, and I think I'm up to 28 or something like that. But there are a lot of islands. By the way, I've I've just booked my trip to uh, uh, Skellig Michael off the shores of uh, Ireland, uh, <laughs> the Holy Island uh, there, and I'm 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 going to make my way to Strophades soon. I hope so. I am I am always. Uh, thinking of my the next island visit. And uh, so the hybridity, well, to be sure, and I can only speak to, uh, well, I don't like to talk about things I'm not sure about. So uh, I, the Spotico has imports, impressive imports, as I said, from Africa, from the Levant, from all over, the, and it, it, Uranus has, has imports, it's astonishing how many sources of pottery and the syro palestinian glass and so these are these are places of destinations of pilgrimage have very mixed populations coming of course the Ptolemaic army itself was incredibly mixed um with uh you know professional soldiers i won't call them mercenaries but coming from all over the the greek world so there there is a this is the great you know, melting pot of religious uh, centers uh, bring people together. So I do think that there is much more of a mixture of populations at religious centers, also port towns, I mean, ports get it with ships coming in and out. And of course, Neapophos is the, the greatest port, uh, you know, so this, this would have been a thrilling and exciting uh, uh, a place as Alexandria was. <laughs> largest city in the world of its time and um, just burgeoning with um, ships coming and going. So I do think that this is a reflection of these uh, vibrant Hellenistic times, at least for Uranusos, vibrant archaic times for, uh, and and even early Iron Age for the Spotico. Um, so the Spotico is, a, is focused much earlier on the, you know, but the islands are always crossroads, and they're always um, sort of at the center of things. 
Thank uh, you. So yeah. <laughs> All right. So switching gears a little bit, you talked about the the ceramic assemblages found on Euronisos, uh, where people would have been staying on the island. How long do you think people stayed when they came? And knowing that ancient people didn't have paper plates uh, and other modern conveniences uh, that we might take on a trip uh, in, in lieu of our nice plates that we use every day, do the ceramics show any evidence of being lower quality or that they were created more hastily uh, from those from contemporaneous permanent settlements nearby? No, there's some very fine pottery on Uranusos, which is so remarkable. But um, we do have what I showed you today were the what I regard as the archaeology of the individual, the pilgrim kits. So they traveled, you traveled with your own, uh, you know, like we might take a canteen, uh, but they had their own or your own silverware, your knife, fork, and spoon set. Um, that's why I showed you the, the little vessels with a hole so you could strap your own cup on your belt. I will say that we have, I showed it in my um, archaeology hour talk, uh, a, an echinus bowl, very nice size, you can hold nicely in your hand, not too big, of really thick walled Nile mud. And this is, it's, it's uh, thick, it's not a pretty object, it's strong, it's almost, it, you can't imagine it breaking, it's so durable. And this seems to be, uh, according to Yolanta Mornarczyk, our pottery expert, a uh, probably the, the a possession of a sailor, someone that it can slip it in your kit and take it on the road and um, always have your cup drinking bowl to drink out of. So there, I can distinguish between those personal items that you would travel as people would go from festival to festival or sanctuary to sanctuary, they would have their own, maybe their own little frying pan and their own, they, they would bring these along because you couldn't expect to get there and have a whole, you know, as you said, place service ready for you. Um, so you brought your own and we're getting some of those. And then the, the imports, the you know, the cask glass bowls um, and uh, Eastern Sigillata A and things like this, whether people are bringing that or whether they, I don't know, I don't know. They're, they're getting it in Paphos or something like that. It's possible. Good question. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously, especially for people who tuned in earlier, there's a lot of interest in Euronisos. Um, and we're, someone's asking, um, could you talk a little bit more about the archaeological advantage of excavating a place that has been, you know, very difficult to access um, and flourish, you know, had that po point of flourishing was over such a short period of time, rather than something that was, you know, consistently occupied. Well, it's very challenging, and I, at the opening of my archaeology hour talk, I, I did, uh, I did, uh, ex you know, express the frustration of of finding one unique thing after another, or one rare thing after another, something with no parallels anywhere after another, because you can't say, oh, we have, you know, the same thing over here that helps us understand ours. It is it's something absolutely unique is going on in this place, uh, and. It is, it is a, a massive puzzle, and it has been intellectually stimulating beyond words, and we have brought together all the greatest minds in uh, the specialties and fields. Um, the great thing about Uranusos is that we don't have an overwhelming mass of material, so you can get world authorities, so they'll say, I'm very busy, I can't take on any new projects. Oh, well, there are only, you know, this many lamps or this, and then you... you we get all around the table and we bounce these ideas off of each other. So what it, it's a challenging site. Some day, some seasons, you don't know. You might miss a whole week here because of bad weather or you know, plan to do this and then you can't. And you always have to have plan A, plan B and plan C every day based on weather, whether the boat might break down or the engine, whether the, you know, any number of logistical issues. So it, it teaches patience, it, teach, it teaches humility. The biggest lesson I've learned is um, how much we do not know. You know, we are so at, likely in archeology span say, oh, I'll look it up and that's like that, bingo, solved. But um, living with questions over decades, um, 
and learning from different people. And in some cases, waiting for people to be born that will grow up and then study the material. <laughs> Because we, it took us many years to find our roof tile expert. Um, it, it's just great. It's great. And it also makes you very cautious and don't jump on, don't jump on a solution quickly because um, letting things, let it, you know, every object when put beside another object reflects meaning differently and and every season I learn something new and I and the and the the most humbling thing is to have a working hypothesis which we all must have and then you become very comfy with it and you love it and it's yours and then you with your own hands dig something that completely refutes it now if somebody <laughs> else had dug it somewhere else you could say oh well they blah. but if you've done it yourself and you have to be intellectually honest then you have to kiss your favorite uh, interpretation goodbye and let it float away. And I've had to do that many times. And that's really good life lesson um, is, and if you're, you know, if, if you're sitting in the library and doing this on paper, it's much easier to discard something than if you found it with your own hands. Uh, and that keeps you honest. It keeps your feet to the fire. It keeps you, it, and uh, it makes you realize how little we really know. Holding solid evidence in your hand definitely can change things. Um, there's a lot of more interest in the dance floor. Um, so, so we, uh, we also have someone asking, um, could you uh, co compare it at all to the sort of the dance, the, the uh, threshing floors you see other el elsewhere in the Mediterranean where celebrations might have taken place after a harvest? Uh, yeah. Yes, well, here is where we have to be careful because um, very well, it, you know, I, I would need to um, know more about the fields in the Spadico where there's a set uh, uh, that threshing floors and dance floors are are the very same space, so you you can't know. Uh, but the problem with Uranusos and the reason why on Uranusos I think it has a better chance of being a dance floor is there is no way to grow wheat up there. I mean, there is no water irrigation, whatever. It's the space is very very small. I think they look. To be fair, they may have grown some little bit of wheat up there. They might have done a little farming because we have what we call the Great Plains between <laughs> the Central South sector and and the cisterns. There we did we did in 2009. We spent the whole season exploring. We have the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Great Plains, and we went into that section and we did a series of nine trenches along a diagonal. And the poor, unfortunate students that year, eight of them got blanks, and one of them, Russell Freelinghuisen, got everything because he was on the edge of the island. So, so we we were we really to to get nine empty trenches in eight empty trenches in the middle of the island leads me to believe that that part may have been left open for some kind of cultivation, but very minor. It wouldn't have needed a threshing floor of that 430 tons of marine silt brought up there to thresh the amount of wheat that could be grown in the tiny, tiny space of Uranusos, if any, ever. So you see what I mean? So we have to explain what is this thing that it was so important that they they went to such effort and expense to build it. Fair, fair enough. Okay, so switching from agricultural to uh, to spiritual, um, any evidence that the Christian Church attempted to co-opt the sanctuaries as Christian sites later on? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, I, you know, nothing happens on Uranusos till the great basilicas are built on the mainland at Cape Drepanum. And then the little island comes to life again. And we have the building of this uh, sixth century church on the eastern tip of Uranusos. And uh, we have some tower houses and a new cistern built. And I think a small community of monks came over 
Um, and we actually, to answer the question directly, they put up a circuit wall, uh, scrappy, not very serious wall, where the island has collapsed in the fourth century owing to the earthquakes. And then they put little Christian crosses on the blocks, I think to say, now this is our land and not um, you know, to kind of disempower the pagan aspect of um, the uh, Holy Island, which had been called Holy Island from at least the end of the first century BC. Uh, and we even have found an amulet that on the bottom, it has, uh, it has a trident, it has a dolphin and a crab, and it that's nicely carved, deep, deep impressions. And then on the side, and very scratchy, there's a cross. And I think that some monk or Christian pilgrim on Uranusos found this ancient object and disempowered it um, and um, made it. Uh, it becomes by the 16th century maps, uh, St. George is up there, Santa Jersey, and there's a church with a bell tower on your own. So, so absolutely, it's, there's a continuity. And um, Apollo to St. George is a pattern that we find in many different sites where um, the young beardless god who kills the uh, serpent at Delphi is replaced by the young beardless saint who kills uh, the dragon. Well, let's end things with one last question going back to Apollo, uh, <laughs> reclaim for Apollo. Um, given that, it, you know, the connection to Apollo, is there uh, anything, any feature of the site that uh, lines up with important sun locations, given the connection or, you know, with Apollo? Uh, I, I mean, the, the temple style building, you note how I'm always careful not to say it's a temple. The temple style building is facing east. So yes, there's that. Uh, I will also say fascinatingly, the little church on the mainland, the church that I, uh, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's probably, I don't know, probably 13, starting in the 13th century. It's hard to say, it's not well dated, um, but that has a window and the light beam comes in and hits the altar. The altar is a two column, capitals taken from the Justinianic Basilica turned upside down on one another and it hits it it's a little window and the light beam comes in and hits the top of the altar on November 17th uh, the same day that St. George has his feast day only here instead of April 23rd and so I think that 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 is something I think that 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 would is where I would go with this. I would look about um, I would look about the light and the stars and uh, all of that in November, which seems to have been is the calmest month for crossing the seas, amazingly. Yeah, great question. Well, Joan, thank you so much. Um, this was fantastic. Uh, for all of you here, again, if you'd like to watch this video, we'll have it on YouTube shortly. Um, and if you missed Joan's Ar AIA Archaeology Hour talk earlier this month, that is already on our YouTube channel. Uh, I want to encourage you all to stay connected with the AIA, uh, become a member, support our programs. We'll keep you informed. Uh, Joan's talk today uh, and her talks previously this month are part of a larger lecture series. Uh, we have two more speakers in the coming months, uh, including our return next month with Mesoamerican archaeologist David Carballo, who will talk uh, to us about 16th century Mexico and the archaeology of the very different interactions the Aztecs and their neighbors, the Tlaxcaltecs, had with the Spanish. Um, so make sure you register for the upcoming talks to stay tuned. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out and thank you Joan for spending so much time with us over the last week and a half. Uh, I'm pretty sure this Q&A session has evoked even more questions, but I'm so glad we got to as many questions as we did today. Um, and well, it's been a pleasure. So, and goodbye for now. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. <laughs> Bye. -bye.